revolutionary in a way. I've never actually read a book quite like this. It's, mm -hmm. it's erotic, but it's also, it's also about real life. And so we were talking about this earlier today. There's a lot of erotica that's very formulaic and um, kind of purposely um, distanced from reality so we can all get into that space and not think about real life. Right. Um, but this one, I think, gets closer to the actual experience of our bodies and um, our sexual lives as women uh, than any book I've ever read. But it, it's also about a lot of other things, too, and a kind of collective, I think it's a collective um, statement on Karen's life to date, if I might be so bold as to say that, because she's a person who goes through life really feeling it and, and processing it and thinking about it. And that's the gift she gives us. That's what writers do, that they give good writers give us that gift so that we can see it. And we say, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Um, so I just, I want to read you very quickly an example of the kind of thing that is here mixed into this. Um, I guess, you know, it is, it is an erotic novel, but here we go. The scent cleared her head. She squeezed the lavender, loving him, that boy, her boys, her life. Sometimes love was like this, in Kuwait, rising out of nowhere, and suddenly everywhere, thick, blinding. It knocked you in the head, tossed you into the storm, and smelled sweet. Flecks of white and silver white blew into her, side, into her sideways, wind propelled, caught in her eyelashes and hair and mouth. Love. It was exactly like this. So, thank you. Karen, thank you for coming. Oh, my pleasure. In fact, you know, I basically, I basically bombarded Allison. And I was like, I'm going to be on the West Coast, and uh, I think I should come and do a reading at your house, or something <laughs> like that. And and she said, Okay, come. <laughs> Partly because I really wanted to come back to protection. I haven't been here for a long time, so it's a, it was a very dear place for me for a long time, and I lived on the coast. So thank you all very much for coming, and thank you for introducing the work and me that way. Um, I wrote the book, this book, The Change Room, um, partly out of partly out of a kind of desperation, because I'd been working on another book that was very, very similar to, um, I mean, not similar in story, but similar in energy and concern as The Lizard Cage in Burmese Lessons. So it was a novel that was set in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, and it was about the sex trafficking of children and it was a very complex story about, well, you, anything you can imagine in that realm, you can imagine any possible de like, you know, depravity, and it already exists. You just Google it and you can find that story. And so I was working on that book because I'd done so much writing around human rights in, in Southeast Asia, and I, that was my field in a way, like I had worked in that world f as a writer for really t 15 years and had written earlier about Thailand as well. So I was working on that book and I worked on that novel for three years, but I got so depressed writing it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I became, I also had a really hard time working on that novel because I had a young child and, and he is in fact half Asian. So his my writings and his body became weirdly associated and it just felt very unhealthy to me to be to continue working on something like that when it was so depressing and it was kind of confusing my primary relationships with you know with my own child so i was just like okay i can't do it anymore i'm going to stop which is a very strange thing for me as a writer to do i mean i've been a writer really since i was a kid <clears throat> and i'm you know, I started lots of novels when I was young, but by the time I was in my 20s, whatever book I began or envisioned, I finished it. So this is my 11th book. 
But it would have been another 11th book if I had stuck for a few more years with this very difficult novel. Um, so I stopped working on it because it was making me depressed. And I thought, what could I write that, wouldn't, that would kind of give me a lift and actually make me happy and remind me what it was like to be a young writer? And, you know, when I was a young writer, I just wrote because I was in love with writing and language and the poetry of language and the power of naming the world. So that's what I, that's what the question that I had in my mind. And what I started writing was a very, very sexy scene in sort of around a pool and connected to a change room between two women. And for some of you who know some of my work, One Room in a Castle has a short story about two women who fall in love. Really, they fall in lust. And it all starts in the steam room. Um, <laughs> so, so this is an ongoing fantasy for me, obviously. And I'm, I'm quite heterosexual. I'm, I would say I'm queer, but I'm married to a man. And that's how I've always presented myself in the world. So it was, it was not a surprise for me to write this for myself. But I had such a good time doing it that I thought, so what would happen if I, if I took this project seriously and I actually explored sensuality and sexuality in a, in, a, in a writerly way? What would happen? And so that's what I started doing. And my agent and my publisher at Random House were very surprised when I made the announcement one day that I had stopped working on the, on the novel set in Southeast Asia, and, and here were 60 pages, and it was the first 60 pages of this book. And they were like, what? what, what? <laughs> and they were completely sort of shocked and t completely taken aback. But they, you know, accepted it. I mean, my, my, my publisher actually was thrilled. She was like, this is great! <laughs> So, so that's how the book sort of came into being. And it's about, it's about all of those things that Alison mentioned. It's about marriage and sexuality and marriage and the boredom of sexuality and marriage when you have young children and you're working hard. And I live in Toronto and the novel is set in Toronto. So it's kind of about urban, the speed of urban life and, uh, and how people, both men and women, don't really have time for, for an erotic life when, when life is like that. And then many of us, for all kinds of reasons, you know, find at one point or another that that's part of life, that it becomes neglected for, for all kinds of different reasons. So that's what, I took that as my material, and, and that's what I started to write about. And I just, I'll just read you a couple of little... Um, a couple of the epigraphs that I have in the book. And one is by Barbara Pym, who you might know as an English novelist, who wrote, um, you know, who wrote a lot about just sort of very regular middle class life in England as it was connected to the Anglican Church because her father was a rector, a vicar. Um, and this is from a book called Excellent Women. And it's a book that, weirdly enough, influence the writing of this book. <laughs> I know. Barbara's like, oh my god, don't say that out loud. She's rolling in her grave right now. <clears throat> in which she says, virtue is an excellent thing, and we should all strive after it. But it can sometimes be a little depressing. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Um... It was a book of, it's a book of great wit and humor, but very subtly done. And another of the little epigraphs that is very meaningful to me is actually by the, the um, Iranian singer Gugush. And uh, the, the character, the lover character in the novel is French-Iranian. She's very Canadian, but she also has another kind of background and another language and another history that Eliza the sort of busy working mother, doesn't really know anything about. But Gugush is really, really famous in Iran and, and um, any sort of Farsi-speaking territory in the Middle East. And she must be in her 60s or 70s now, but she is still completely, like she is the sexiest, most fabulous, 
woman in the world in Iran, and you see pictures of her still all over Kurdistan and in Afghanistan even. So the song is um, called New Season, and the, the lyrics are, Look at me, how I run fearless to the borders of the old stories. So here, here we go. Eliza goes swimming twice a week. She's a very busy woman, and she's managed in her busy life to carve out two mornings per week. She runs a little flower shop, which is kind of not so little, it's sort of an upscale um, venture in which she sort of caters to marriage planners and folks like that. Somebody brought their dog. That's true. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> mm -hmm. Um... Anyway, I'll read this little intro to you. Hello. After she dropped the boys off, she hurried along the icy street, afraid of slipping. A few other parents, late getting their kids to school, waved in her direction. They were also in a rush. No one could stop and chat, thank God. I have 45 minutes, she thought, and picked up her pace. The intensity of her own need was unfamiliar. Not need. She didn't need anything. That was for children. And Andrew. She wanted. It's desire, she thought. And one, skate for, one foot skated forward unexpectedly on the ice. Her arms shot out as she caught herself. Resettling her heavy bag on her shoulder, she felt a twinge there, an old ache. Torn ligaments years ago in Greece one serious surgery when she returned. The sidewalks were treacherous and the roads worse. Accidents were already happening today across the city on the highways. She'd asked Andrew to leave the car at home, but he'd said, don't worry, I'll be fine. She had not thought of that word in a thousand years, desire. Who had the time for it? Desideris. She'd taken two years of Latin at university, four of ancient Greek, the brilliant, useless languages, dead like the stars. Desire came from the Latin root, desideris, meaning of the stars. She felt alone in her exhaustion, but she knew that she was not alone. She was one of millions of women working their brains out and their asses off. She had no right to complain, sitting as she was at the top of the pyramid, white skin, warm house, healthy children, a loving husband. Some days, usually on the weekends when she read the newspapers, she felt her luck swell and stick in her throat. She swallowed it down with clean water, queasy, stomach churning, her eyes open, eating up the articles, the reports, the photographs in the world section. People stood at the flooded, burning heart of the world, howling kids in their arms, or dead on the ground. Bombs fell, the plague spread, the refugees fled and fled and fled, and always, always there were women trapped somewhere, in rape camps, raped lives. Eliza was free! She said it out loud sometimes, in the midst of whining about all she had to do. This is freedom! Two times a year she got melodramatically sick. Her body knew that only illness would bring real rest. Last year, sitting on the examining table, she'd said to the doctor, It's just my cold, finally breaking up. The doctor had lifted her eyes from her cool stethoscope on Eliza's hot chest and responded, Actually, it's just your pneumonia settling in. <laughs> Even while the kids were babies and toddlers, she had worked. Maternity leave did not exist for the self-employed. Years passed, as they do, with at least one breast and half her mind attached to her babies. Now Marcus and Jake were big boys going to school. She still felt the elastic delight of being out of the house full time. Thumping their hips, her friends would say, The baby weight is disappearing. My body's coming back. A lie. It never came back the body before children, the old life. She knew the truth. Love cleaves you right through the middle. 
She would never be closed again, never again singular. She was divided in three by husband and sons. No, she was divided in four because of the house, an old Victorian four-story, always clamoring for attention. They had renovated it slowly, room by money-sucking room. <laughs> the house belonged to both of them, yes. Yeah, some, some laughter, some familiar laughter in the group. <laughs> yep. But she was the one who took care of it like the housekeeper out of an old English novel, right down to the keys, the platters, the good cutlery, the power tools, pliers, paint cans, to say nothing about keeping the place clean, which reminded her of that shelf in the fridge covered in some sticky, gelatinous substance. She shook her head and stepped over a gleaming artery of ice. This was it, this gift of an hour on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. She must not think about the fridge. The water whispered, you are not as divided as you feel. Her skin was complete, despite the cuts, broken glassware at work, the slip of a new pruning knife, her heel punctured by that nail during the flood cleanup in the basement last spring, even the way she tore twice with the births. The wounds closed and she floated. So she goes to the pool and she uh, greets her friends and goes swimming and she notices that there is um, a new swimmer at the swimming pool, a woman that she has not seen before. And she is curious about this woman. Down she went, down, down, if only it were deeper, if only the sea. When her toes touched the rough paint on the bottom of the pool, she pushed off, stretched out, dolphin kicked half of her first length underwater. The undulations made her think of an otter, then a snake. She was animal again, returned to her element. The other swimmer was two lanes away, a woman. Once Eliza had done a few lengths to warm up, she tried to keep pace, but the other woman in her sleek black suit was too fast taller, longer arms. That was all she could see underwater or when she paused to get her breath at one end of the pool. And out they get. This is the important first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it was to, uh, in a way I realized, it was to play with the um, with the, the templates of pornography but do something else with those templates. Make other things happen. And, and you won't get to see what other things happen, but <laughs> I'll read a little bit of this to you, their first meeting. The woman was naked under the shower. It was impossible not to look at a naked body framed by white tiles. Gorgeous breasts, full but lifting also, lifting up into dark pink nipples. Such beautiful breasts were rare. She was shaved, too. The line of pubic hair that rose up from the slit was slightly wider than a finger. Eliza put her goggles around a tap across from the Amazon, which is what she calls her, because she's sort of tall and strong, then went to get her shampoo and conditioner. Children were getting changed. She wasn't going to take off her bathing suit until all of them had left for the class. Two naked women might be, might be overwhelming, which apparently... They are for the Canadian media. <laughs> no, nobody has, no major Canadian media, except for Sheila Rogers, has interviewed me about this book. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I, I was just having such a good time writing it that I didn't even think that somebody might be weirded out by it. <laughs> what did Sheila want to know? <laughs> oh, she loved it. She loved it. So we had a great talk, and that should air probably in the next couple of weeks, next two or three weeks. And the rest right. went to what they want. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Uh, anyway, I'll talk more about that after, maybe. Uh, anyway, so she's looking at the kids and just seeing how perfect they are and also thinking that, you know, seeing these beautiful little kids is like a covert plot to try and get her pregnant again. <laughs> <laughs> she's like... And, she's, and then she realizes, she thinks, oh, I must be ovulating, that's why I'm feeling this way. She feels like a stab in her belly and thinks I'm ovulating. 
Or maybe that was it. Just then, the egg had dropped off the ledge into the fallopian tube like a swimmer into her lane. Is that where the word desire had come from? Here they were, the children, every one of them pulled out of a woman who had ovulated nine months before they were born. The beauty of small children was a covert plot to make her get pregnant again. But she would resist, not another one. They were rosy and talkative, bubbling with news and questions. The white tiled room filled <coughs> with the sound of them squawking, cooing, complaining. And this goes on for a while, this delight in the kids, and then they leave. And she notices, you know, she's admiring the children, but she notices that the Amazon is completely uninterested. <laughs> The Amazon continued to scour her prize-winning tits with a loofah. <laughs> She's like, very imperious. The children disappeared, as they would disappear soon enough. Children never lasted for long. They would return as young adults in their 20s, and Eliza would still be here, a naked older woman rubbing shampoo over her back and under her arms because she couldn't be bothered to bring soap. She was 42, not old yet, though older, she thought, than her, the naked woman across the room, bent over now and shaving her legs. Amazing what women did in public places these days. The Amazon <laughs> seemed to have no shame. <laughs> None of the regular women ever shaved their legs here. It reminded Eliza to at least take off her swimsuit and soap up her chlorine-smelling skin, one shoulder, the other, the polyester was thinning already. She pushed the suit down over her breasts, hips, legs, stepped out, hung the dark blue skin of herself on the shower faucet. At least the woman had turned her ass to the wall to bend over. What, Eliza wondered, did the wall see? <laughs> <laughs> the flower of the vulva, intricate folds and layers, thin or thick labia, slender and folded in and in like her own, or fleshy and succulent, folding out like a red canna or a calla lily. The comparison was right, she thought, defending herself to an invisible judge who asked her why she was thinking about this. It used to be Andrew's fond joke, my wife peddles genitalia, though it was never completely a joke. It was true. Flowers are the sexual organs of plants. Well, really, it was hard not to look at a naked body bending over like that. The nipples gathered water, turned into two small waterfalls. The length of the planes of bone invited the eye to glide down the healthy flesh. Creamy skin, black hair, like the heroine out of witch novel. The muscles in Eliza's legs and arms flexed as the Amazon sent the razor down her ankle. Maybe she was a fitness instructor. Ashtanga teacher, personal trainer. Did anyone do aerobics anymore? It was spin classes and hot yoga now. Even Pilates had become passé. Every time the woman drew the razor up her shin, a series of muscles in her torso actually rippled. <laughs> <laughs> Eliza closed her eyes, glad no one else was around to see her staring. They all looked at each other's bodies, covertly, shyly. It was natural. There were so many bodies, long and lush like this woman's, or voluptuous and plump, like her friend Janet, or straight-hipped, small-breasted. The woman with the sore neck and rich sun still had a slender waist and a nice ass, despite stretch marks and more than 60 years of life behind her. And the... the the woman with the sore neck has a really annoying husband, or not husband, cha son, who she's very proud of, and he's a developer in Vancouver. In another scene, you get to hear her going on about how he drives a Porsche. <laughs> another older woman came sometimes, too, and she was hilarious, always crooning in the change room about how wonderful it was to see other women naked, how different everyone was. <coughs> People didn't talk to her too much. <laughs> her, her enthusiasm frightened them. She was large and jiggly, great-breasted. Hers was the shape of that ancient goddess dug up in Turkey, and it became mightily apparent how much she liked that fact when she announced it one day to the embarrassed silence of the other swimmers. Eliza had just smiled and said, Well, it's always good to have a goddess in the change room. 
A few others laughed politely while the big woman guffawed with delight. That's why she was frightening. It wasn't just her enthusiasm. People were not accustomed to blatant happiness. It made them as nervous as naked flesh. She glanced at her again, then away. The Amazon straightened up and thrust her long bladed shins into the spray. Lovely to look, but not nice to stare. She was finished, but she stayed on under the hot water, rubbing the last of soap off herself. Their eyes met briefly, and briefly they smiled. She squeezed some conditioner into her hand and massaged it into her hair. Other people had sex once a week. She had the pool twice. She couldn't remember the last time she had had sex with her husband. More than a month ago? More like six weeks. Surely the current dry spell could not have been more than two months. Please, God. That was life with two small children. Night wakers both. It was nothing to be ashamed about, sexlessness. And I'm not ashamed, she thought. I'm just horny. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously she was ovulating. The survival of the race had once depended upon fucking. No longer, of course. The opposite was true now. The last thing the poor planet needed was more fucking humans. And Andrew did not want to have another one. The last of her eggs was falling through her body. Soon there would be no more. And she had never felt so lustful in her life. The Amazon spoke in a surprisingly loud voice. That was fun. Sorry? Eliza tried to decipher the echoey words. It was fun to race you. You beat me. Mmm, mmm, the tall woman. And she grinned. I did beat you. Soundly. I like to win. She grinned more. Eliza found she couldn't respond to the come on in the woman's tone. Who talked like that? No one she knew. She smiled back politely. I would love to swim more. Get in shape. You are in beautiful shape. Okay, so maybe some people did talk like that. Eliza closed her eyes and put her head back into the spray. Her neck felt too exposed. She said, thank you, likewise. She knew the Amazon was looking at her, for she had invited the other woman's eyes by closing her <coughs> own. She felt the live current running through the air between them. That much electricity in a shower room had to be dangerous. <laughs> her heart thumped in her throat and her water drum ears. It has come to this, she thought, flirting with a hot young woman at the pool. Andrew and I must have sex. <laughs> but had Eliza flirted, or had she been flirted with? She was too busy for sexual innuendo, or too tired. She flipped through her mental roller decks of fellow school moms and dads. In eight years in the school playground at the park, dropping off and picking up for play dates, she had not flirted with a single one of them. They were sexless zombies with toddlers and full-time jobs, just like her. She put, she put her hand on the tiled wall beside her to keep her balance. That was the solution she had found to many of the problems of middle-aged, middle-class life. Keep the eyes closed, maintain balance. She listened to the water splashing for a long, long time. Skin ruddy in the heat of the spray, she stood there and stood there, wasting the precious water of Lake Ontario. When she entered the change room, it was empty, as she had hoped, and now she was disappointed. She stood there naked, dripping, and imagined herself fully dressed, pushing out the swing door and catching up with her to say, what? What could she say? Mm -hmm. So I didn't read like any of the, uh, you know, that was just an introduction, but in, Salt Spring, <laughs> <laughs> but in Salt Spring Island, they demanded that I read a sex scene. So yes. <laughs> yes. We're We're not going to be locked by Salt Spring. Yeah. <laughs> they did, it was really funny. It was very funny, so I did my best. I challenged myself as an, as an author. But maybe we could take a little break and we could just talk about it or work out my, you know, it's, it's an intimate family home. Maybe sexy now that feels like. So I wonder if there's any questions. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We'll see, we'll see how we. 
feel about more graphic, um, yeah. I just find it interesting that you would find it embarrassing to read it when you didn't write it. The page was about, you know, men in solitary confinement being tortured and eating lizards and, you know, just very, very shocking in itself, but yeah, we got, I got more media more easily for a book set in Burma than I am getting for a novel set in Toronto, so it's very weird. Even the Toronto media, nobody's, uh, nobody's talked about it. And yet when, I'm, when I've done events publicly, I, I've invariably had really great responses and there's been lots of discussion and lots of questions. So it's a subject that it seems many people, I mean partly the book is about um, I mean, it's about a marriage that's changing, right? The woman is discovering not only that she is sexually crazy about this other woman, but that something is happening to this marriage. Like, can it be, can it be changed? Can the shape of the marriage be changed? And, you know, more and more people are having that conversation, or at least curious about that. Like, what, what are the boundaries around modern marriage? And a lot of those are shifting because... Marriage is not the same as it was 20 or 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and so I think that's another reason why people find the novel a little bit. Because it's questioning some, that basic institution. And uh, I guess that's freaking some people out. Yeah, and we talked about this too, that some of the tropes that we're used to, that if you do those kinds of things and make those transgressions, that someone's got to suffer somewhere along the way. Yeah. Yeah, the woman is supposed to be beaten up, one of her children is supposed to die, and in the end she's supposed to commit suicide. That was a New York Times best-selling book, House Frau. That's what happened. That's the summary of that book. And the sex wasn't even good. <laughs> Forget that! There are going to be multiple orgasms in this book! <laughs> so in some ways, the, the, this extraordinary relationship that begins between these two women who are just incredibly attracted to each other, it is a fantasy. But like, like, like many relationships in the beginning are kind of fantastical, right? They are, so they rely on um, romance and fantasy and imagination. Do you, do you think that the response you're getting is kind of a sign of the ultra-conservatism that's raised its head in our time? And well, we also the... cannot find a publisher for this novel in the States. Can't? Mm-hmm. Because the climate is so... Um... In the States, it's even worse than in oh, Canada. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Much, much worse, which is pretty depressing. Yeah, it is a sign of that. But I also think that it's just a larger sign of, even though we live in a culture where we now, you know, we now have divorce, and we now have single moms, and dads and people who have children without a partner and we have gay marriage and we, we accept we are legally we legally recognize unions between variously gendered people all of those things that's part of our culture in Canada we're still very very resistant like or we're very afraid of we're very afraid of um, the body I guess because this is a body loving book I mean it's very even with the children and her husband, she loves her husband. Like there's a lot of love in the book between the the couple, the you know the primary couple. Um, so that's not like that, that. There's also love there, and they and they have a sexual relationship as well. <coughs> she doesn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, we live in a time where on YouTube you can see a woman be caned for mercilessly for showing her hair. Oh, no, I know, but we also live with very violent pornography, right? It's available at the click of a button. And and yet, yeah, it's, it's, I haven't, I've just published the book. It's about a month old. It's a, it's a baby. Um, So I haven't finished thinking about it. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, oh, and the other problem I have to admit is that Char, Shar is a sex worker who's transitioning out of a very upper end escorting job. Who's Shar? Shar is the lover. The Amazon. The Amazon. Amazon. Shar is the Amazon. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And she's 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 done a psychology degree and she's done um, her masters and she's also just done this um, 
uh, this kind of postdoc work in Toronto. So she's actually sort of on her way to becoming a sex therapist. Um, and she's very, she's, she almost feels resistant about giving up her, her work, her very privileged, very, very privileged, very safe brand of sex work. Um, and I guess, uh, maybe I overdid it, eh? Do you think? Like, maybe that's just too much for people. <laughs> but I also wanted, if I was going to, if I was going to write a book about sexuality and sex and all of that stuff, I, I guess, I guess I was, I was trying to think about, you know, just what I've done. Because sometimes you don't know what you've actually done as a writer until you're finished. So then you start to think about it. You have to see yourself as a warrior of our times in art and literature because political correctness is having a coming back yeah. among yeah. the Trumps and the Marine Le Pens and the Brexits and yeah, all true. the conservatism. I so. guess... Yeah, and I, I, I wanted so I wanted to I wanted to kind of explore as much as possible, I guess, about our perceived ideas about sexuality, including sex work, because we have very very fixed ideas about who who and why people who does it and why they do it, um, and and ironically, the first novel that I worked on had that theme in it of trafficking, but there was also a kind of sex work theme. And so that's why I started talking to sex workers. I started interviewing sex workers um, in Calgary and Toronto and Ottawa. And I, I was kind of, I was educated. I received a real education from the women um, that I spoke to. And so the theme that I had in, or the character that I had been building in the other novel was was a false character because none of the people that I was talking to had the typical story that we all associate with all sex workers because of course many, you know, many just like in any other walk of life many people have been sexually abused or have suffered trauma that, that's not limited to people who work in the sex trade and the women I was speaking to, none of them had that background and they were very, very insistent that 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 it was clear to me as an interviewer receiving knowledge from them about their work that, that, that I understood that that's not why they were involved in sex work. So, so that was really fascinating. That was, and so I wanted to put that in the book because again it was something that had flipped my own understanding about um, you know a kind of dark area of sexuality. And it shouldn't be dark, it should be legalized, it should be completely decriminalized, and that's what all sex workers of all sort of tiers will, will tell you. And that's very challenging. You know, that's obviously a very challenging thing. Do you remember Judy Chicago's dinner party? I do, and I also remember Erica Jong's Fear of Flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like these truly well, shocking, yeah. fabulous books. Because I saw Judy Chicago's dinner party in Calgary, and I reminded some of the conversation or some of the comments made about, you know, how kind of uptight we are. And I remember watching, I, I was really fascinated by this amazing art collection. I mean, it was yeah. uh, just an, a, a really beautiful event, and it was just so exciting to be part of that. Can you describe what it is for people who might not know? Some, a couple of people might not know what it actually well, is. Judy Chicago's dinner party is, was a huge collection of, of plates. Yeah. These were dinner plates, but they were all created around uh, a woman's um, vagina, um, the everything, like the sexual it, it was her, uh, the sexuality of woman through her vaginal space. It was yeah. very beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the unfolding of these beautiful, like this, these shapes and colors and the depth and intensity, and some of them was just like, holy cow, but it was the people that were going around this immense table. Like it was a, it was a gigantic immense. table. Yeah, I never saw immense. it. I just saw photographs of it. I was a it kid was, when it, yeah, when it, it was, came it was out. Immense. It was immense. It filled all of McLeod Hall, you know, A, B, and C. You had, you could wear your pieces. That There was a description as you went by every single plate. I don't know how many plates. There might have been, what, 60 or 70 plates? It was mm -hmm. just, it was an amazing collection. And yet, it, it was the people that were wa were walking through this, and I was I'm still quite taken by what I saw, the discomfiture of some, like mm -hmm. holy cow, 
is that really what we look like? And she's put it in a plate, you know. I mean, <laughs> kind of, like, holy mackerel. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think sometimes it's our own, like even how you read, you read with a lusciousness that's quite, mm -hmm. you know, you. like it's, mm -hmm. it's a very sexy kind of approach to reading. I mean, I, you know, you read as if you're really, you know. Into it? Well, you're, 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 yeah. but, but it, but no, no, I know what you mean. It's very luscious. Very sensual. Yes, it is. Yes. That's the word. It's not just luscious. It's sensual. Yeah. So, um, I, and I think it's how we receive that, because to see Judy Chicago's dinner party and how people receive that. Like I, you know, it was a very, very long time ago that I went what to What year this. would that have been today? Oh, 1970. It, it would be in the late... Yeah. The 79 mid, or mid, something? Yeah, mid -70s. Like yeah. So that's like decades. But it wasn't in Canada until... Was it prior? It wasn't, it didn't come to Canada until the nine, or, uh, late 80s or 90s. Early I, saw, 90s. I saw it in Calgary and it would have been mm, maybe in the early 80s. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. it was a, it was a, it was a really wonderful experience, but it was, I think, you know, um, not everyone was comfortable to oh, yeah. even those even, no, even all the not. women and men who were there to to see it you could you could just tell by the the lack of electricity shall i say in some parts of the room that it was really hard for some people to actually pull mm -hmm. i don't know if i can handle this any longer you know but uh, so maybe that's maybe that's part of the thing with your book too is you're kind of presenting you know you're really getting people to kind of look at themselves in a different way and i mean you know you think about gone girl well, holy cow, that was a bestseller, wasn't it? And that was a complicated read. But, but it wasn't really about, you know, you didn't go to, to deep, deep places where it's hard to, mm -hmm. you know, describe yourself. Like, I, you know, my husband said to me the other day, he said, you know what, Jan, I just read on the internet, you know, women who masturbate, they have better eyesight. He <laughs> 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 doesn't make you blind. <laughs> 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 They don't go blind. It's not true. The men go blind. The men go blind. The women can see better. But it was such a simplistic comment. I mean, I thought, well, where did that come from? Who wrote that? Well, do you want a little time? I'll just do the introduction of the sex scene. We don't have enough. We don't have enough time. <laughs> you just want us to buy the book. And we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I personally no, I shouldn't even. Okay. Well, you're a very good saleswoman. Just give them an appetite. Just give them an appetite. That's right. An appetite. Yeah. And I, there we go. Yeah, just a little taste. Just a little happy after. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember Robert De Niro in uh, Advocate of the Devil or something like that, the no. movie? What does he say? Robert, Robert De Niro is the devil and, and he's saying um, the paradox of humans, saying uh, devil gives things to humans, instincts, God gives instincts. To humans. Taste, uh, see but don't try. Mm. Try but don't taste. Mm. Taste yeah. but don't swallow. <laughs> So true. <laughs> there's a there's a um, Iranian a Farsi proverb that says the trick is to be not so sweet that they swallow you, but not so bitter that they spit you out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so just before you start, the the story goes on that they she stays in her marriage, but they have the two women have an affair. Is that what goes on? Yeah, like in most you know adulterous relationships, that's what goes on at the beginning. Well, but but I, but then other things develop. I mean, it's also it's very much a book about secrets and what happens to people <coughs> who tell secrets, who hold secrets from each other. Everybody in the story keeps a secret. Her husband keeps a secret. She keeps a very large secret. She keeps the, Eliza, Keenan keeps the defining secret. 
in the novel. Shar also keeps a secret, though like many young sex workers, young educated higher end <coughs> sex workers, they, a lot of them are now out increasingly to their families and to their close friends. Shar decides that, you know, Eliza is actually quite, she realizes, I think, that Eliza is quite conservative. So she doesn't tell Eliza that she's a sex worker. So she keeps that secret. Mm -hmm. And Andrew keeps kind of financial secrets from his wife. So it's very much, and the financial part is kind of, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of in the background of the novel. But it's, it's, all, it's all about power, right? Sex and money all have a lot to do with power. So, so there's a kind of very, again, the book is quite, it's serious, but it's also lighthearted and very fun to read. But it's also, it has these themes that run underneath that are quite heavy, like the stuff about sex and power and the stuff about violence always <coughs> being at the edge of everybody's lives. Like, even though we don't necessarily experience violence, if we're fortunate personally, or we haven't experienced it, um, the, the sense of violence in the world at large is, is a part of the novel. Because, you know, the news is on all the time. Like, the news plays a big role in the book, just how you hear the news on a regular basis and you think about the world. And, and, you know, shooters in the United States coming, like, Eliza has this fear when she's dropping her kids off that, you know, she just realizes how vulnerable, even though they have, you know, they lock the doors at the schools and stuff, she just thinks, you know, if anybody really wanted to get into school and harm children, it would be so easy to do so. So there's this kind of, you know, the reality of, not the reality, but the fear of those things is kind of present in the novel. Because I think it's present in all of our lives, too. Like, especially at this time. Partly, I think, it's also, you know, it's about media, partly because of the media. So eventually, these horny women go home with each other. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she, they meet again a couple times at the pool, and that's basically all it takes. It's not very complicated for them to actually um, start seeing each other, but then, or seeing each other initially, like actually getting sexual together in the change room. Um, not that they actually have sex, but they have a kind of grappling. And Eliza expects to hear from her right away, but she doesn't. There's a waiting period. <laughs> and then eventually, Something happens. I would love to know what you guys were saying over there. What? <laughs> you know, a waiting list is what she said. Uh, yes. A waiting, <laughs> a waiting list. Well, waiting is very erotic. Something happens at the end of it, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, something does happen at the end of Eliza's waiting. Suddenly she gets a text message. And she's like, you know, she just thinks they're going to come running to her. And of course... She doesn't initially, but then she does. And they meet at a very lovely bar um, and start fooling around in public. And then they go to uh, Shar's house. So I'll just read a little bit, because it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Will I be invited back? <laughs> 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 I guess if I can't stay with you, maybe somebody else will invite me. <laughs> oh my goodness. So Eliza is instructed to keep her boots on when she comes into Shar's house, and so she does. And... Uh, This time, Char smiled differently, playfully, oddly innocent considering the circumstances, but it was infectious. Eliza grinned, bobbed her eyebrows up and down. So, now what happens? Ma belle amie, il y a deux méthodes, the slow method and the fast method. As you can tell, I love the slow method. Why should those foodies have all the fun? I started the slow sex movement. If you, if you wait an hour or two for an orgasm, the orgasm is really delicious. Eliza let her head fall back against the sofa. Char, I don't have two hours. 
<laughs> Another time. Tonight we'll just have a snack. <laughs> Speaking of which, you're going to have to close your legs to pull your tights down to your knees. Say please. Please. Sharon did the buttons of her white blouse and pulled the shirt off one shoulder. Eliza inhaled a deep breath and hooked her thumbs into the tightly woven material of her tights. She wriggled her hips and ass out of them, unconcerned about the rolls of fat on her belly. With a woman, even for the first time, you didn't have to wish you were thinner or pretend you were perfect. Most healthy women had flesh on them. It was natural, unremarkable, except that her whole body felt remarkable right now. <laughs> Open, soft, tense, agitated for touch. She left her purple underwear on. In front of her, just like that, Shah's shirt was off. Her bra dropped to the floor. Those lovely breasts. Eliza involuntarily gasped. Keep pulling down your tights and keep your legs open. I need to be able to see you. By the time Eliza had worked the tights down to her knees, she realized why Char had made her keep her boots on. Because she couldn't take off her tights. <laughs> she was stuck. Sitting directly in front of her, Char licked her hands like a cat and rubbed them up and down her nipples. So you guys, it, we are not Christian evangelists. <laughs> no, no need to Thank be, goodness. No, 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 no need to be scared. Don't be shy, she said. Pull your panties down too. I've never seen your pussy. Remember that day at the pool? I touched you, but I didn't get to look. Eliza pulled her underwear to her knees. Keep your legs open. Eliza spread her thighs against the elast elasticity of the tights. It was like doing an absurdly erotic resistance exercise. <laughs> Char's voice dropped lower. <sighs> Can't read that. <laughs> Sorry. Some of it's just too much. When Char was satisfied, she crawled over, eye level with Eliza's quivering thighs. Yeah, can't read that. Because <laughs> 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 I'm having a hot flash. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh la la, look at that. So swollen. <laughs> <laughs> she began to rub the dark. Shh, quiet the peanut butter. She began to rub the dark red nub with her thumb. Eliza didn't know where to send her eyes to that expert thumb, to Char's face, to her gorgeous breasts, the big hard nipples, or back to her own body. Char slid two fingers across the whole, no, can't do that. Yep, can't do that either. <laughs> That's like too much. <laughs> How long? What did you do at salt spray? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's your question. All right, do you want me to one-up salt spray? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to write the Salt Spring Library people a note. <laughs> We're right. not in the library now. <laughs> <laughs> Free to the library. All right, I'll do it. Just as much as you think is one up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, it's not hard with this next paragraph. All right, fine, I'll do it. I'll just do it. We all know what happens. Sharp slid two fingers across the whole glistening mound, found a good rhythm for rubbing and caressing and pressing every wet contour. Eliza couldn't keep the quiver out of her thighs. Each exhalation of breath became a small, out of her thighs, not her cries. Each exhalation of breath became a small cry. She stared down, mesmerized. One finger slid inside her slowly. She gripped it and whined to feel it pull out. And then two fingers entered again, and she pulled Char's hand against her and bucked against it. When a third finger slid in, she cried out. Shh, said Char, don't scream. She kept her fingers inside and massaged Eliza's cervix while still flicking her thumb over her clitoris. Nobody in Canadian literature, in all of Canadian literature's history, has ever read such that much graphic sex <laughs> to any people <laughs> so we can feel a part of Canlet <laughs> and beyond it. Canlet. History on the making. Canlet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to review. Yes. 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 Slow them down. <laughs> Thank you, protection. <laughs> 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 
I don't want to imagine the can clip flag. <laughs> Alrighty then. She kept her fingers inside and massaged Eliza's cervix while still flicking her thumb over her clitoris. How long did Eliza ride around on Char's hand? A minute? Three? Ten? She had no idea. No thoughts. She was all body. She closed her eyes. Rising up, Char came close to her face and whispered, Don't close your eyes. Watch me. Eliza ignored her and kept her eyes closed. <laughs> she wanted to come. She lifted her hips up higher and pushed down. Char's voice was so sexy, so deep and pushy and soft, so unabashedly slutty, <laughs> that each <laughs> phrase was another set of fingers or a cock or a tongue. Each expression pulled the orgasm closer. When Char said, that's it. Oh, no, we can't read that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> too much. Eliza <clears throat> felt herself start to come and just as quickly that circle, that sort of ring began to close. She kept thrusting. She heard her breath become whimpering and was surprised to be coming so fast. Kim's wisely opening the door. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. It's too hard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pussy out there. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, orange, orange cat, orange pussy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was chasing the hummingbird. It was chasing the hummingbird. It's looking for Lynn. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, so I have to read this last little bit so you get the full effect of what happens. Okay. <laughs> so a ring of energy bloomed open inside Eliza and just as quickly began to close. She kept thrusting. She heard her breath become whimpering and was surprised to be coming so fast. Then Shah relaxed her arm and stopped moving her thumb. Eliza cried out in disappointment. Shah slid her fingers away and stroked her again more slowly. For Eliza, the momentum was lost. For Char, it was beginning in earnest. She caught Eliza's angry eye, flashing wide and open, bluer than she had ever noticed, and grinned. She said, Don't be grumpy, Madam Fleur. I think it's time to take off your boots. She had to leave. Think about this. <laughs> Think about this. Before starting the story and the interview, I most acknowledge uh, Kim and Alison. I have to thank them for the hospitality and the hosting of uh, in this wonderful place. I mean, you can see that, right? And uh, before introducing you officially with my guest, or I am the guest, I, am I the guest? We're You're both guest? guests, <laughs> we're both guests. I have to tell the story, okay. right? My wife, my witch, because she is uh, in real life an occultist witch, uh, and I were having coffee in downtown Nanaimo this afternoon, speaking in Spanish, of course, because we were born in Mexico. and. Uh, Karen heard us speaking in Spanish. And so um, she approached, we were taking pictures, and she offered herself to help us taking a picture to help herself to practice Spanish. A very good Spanish, I have to say. And um, we had a little bit of a conversation, and we uh, were told by her that she is a writer and that she was having a reading here in protection, on Protection Island tonight. She invited us, and she left. And then we also left the coffee shop, and the funny thing here is that uh, when we were walking just 
eye shopping uh, in the showcases along the street. Suddenly I had a, a vision and I was, I, and I said to my wife, we didn't ask what kind of writer she is. <laughs> we are just going. What if she's a Christian writer? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, honestly. I told her, I told my wife, honestly, she was a little bit over friendly. Typical, <laughs> typical Christian. <laughs> Probably an evangelist. That's even worse. Imagine yourself as a witch and myself as a, as a, a conceptual um, contracultural artist, alternative artist, in the middle, <laughs> on Protection Island, in the middle of a Christian reading. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what, it's too late. Uh, it's going to be an experience. <laughs> but of course, we were afraid, so we Googled her. <laughs> and when we learned who she was, we were good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Karen, thank you very much for uh, allowing me this interview. With my you. pleasure, my pleasure. Thank I'm going you. to let you, uh, because my audience is not uh, uh, knowledgeable of you, of course. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to let you introduce yourself uh, and then I will ask the questions. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so my name is Karen Connolly. I'm a Canadian writer and um, I've just published my 11th book, which is a novel. I write poetry and essays and travel, travel writing and novels. And a lot of my work has been um, focused on the struggle for human rights in Southeast Asia, particularly in Myanmar. Um, so I've lived a lot of time in Thailand and along the Thai-Burma border and in different places in Europe. Uh, but for the last few years I've been living mostly in Canada and uh, I decided that I needed to learn to write about Canada. So my last book, The Change Room, my new book, is set in the city of Toronto where I now live. And um, Karen, uh you know, I believe that life has its uh, gains. Sure does. Its fates. <laughs> yeah. And it happens to be that uh, my expertise in art after 30 years or three decades is erotic art. Very controversial and very extreme. And you didn't know that. I did not and know that. I didn't that. know your <laughs> writing time. I didn't. And this is... Yes, The Change Room, of course, is a very erotic novel, kind right. of transgressively erotic novel. We had already listened a little bit of it, and <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. I loved it was fun. <laughs> Thank you. The best thing in life is to have fun sex. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's drink to that. I mean, come on. Everybody can drink. You're here. You're here. You're here. You're here. Yeah. Fun sex. Absolutely. Yeah. A fun yeah. sex, too. So, uh, my first question is because... I have a, a motto, a principle in life as an erotic artist because I always work with Eros and Thanatos. Mm -hmm. Part of my work, the, 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 the work that put me among, um, with my uh, friends and brothers in arms from our Mexican art collective, it was very violent, dead about art. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so one of my principles is that uh, in modern times, pornography and eroticism <coughs> are the same thing. But society has uh, made it up somehow to separate them and to, make, to put on them a different style of taboos. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? What do you think the, the, the difference between pornography and eroticism? What is it for you? Well, I think I think uh, you can when you think about erotics, you just think of the word eros because that's the Greek root of the word. So eros is a, is is about life, and it is about it's not it's more than about it's more than sex. It's not only sexuality. It's everything that is life giving, that is alive, that is tactile, that has kind of an its own energy in it. And so 
you know, it's often a sexual thing, but The Change Room is a very erotic novel in all kinds of ways. I mean, Eliza, the main character, has an erotic relationship with everybody in her life. She's, it's, a, it's a lively, it's a sensual book. And, I, you know, the, the, the conversation, the arguments between pornography and eroticism, I think you're right. Those are false, that's a false dichotomy. Those are, that's a false difference, really. But the fact of the matter is that in the last, certainly in the last decade, pornography has become more and more violent. So it has become less and less about life and more and more about violence and pain. There's a lot of pain in pornography now. And the appetite is actually, I mean, I've read transcripts of interviews and conversations with people who make hardcore porn, and the, the appetite amongst the people who consume pornography is for hardcore material. So the pornography has become progressively more violent. And it's a big conversation why that is happening, where that comes from. You know, is that like a death impulse in the human race? Is that a suicidal impulse? Is that the impulse for Thanatos? I mean, those are large philosophical conversations. But we can think about all of the things that are happening around the planet that are anti-life. I mean, the way we live on a daily basis is very pornographic, right? It's very, vi it's hardcore life, right? Like plastics in our oceans and pollution in our air and, you know, um, fracking in Alberta and just all of the, we live with violence all the time, you know, we're, we're in a very violent time yes. in some ways. <laughs> against the earth, I'm talking about the original yeah. body. I'm talking, the about, I'm talking about our first body, the body that we all live on. So, so there's a lot of hardcore violence against the earth all the time. And I don't think those two things are really separate. You know, the, the, har the more we mistreat the earth, the more, the more that violence and somebody actually on Salt Spring Island made this comment, the more that violence becomes a kind, of, a kind of language between all of us that we understand, we recognize it. It's in our video games, it's in our movies, there's a kind of miserableism even in, our, even in the shows that we watch. There's so many, we all know this, there are so many detective shows that are about killing women. Yes. The women are dead. Or they Way too many, it. I would say. <laughs> yeah, and there's tons of those. There are dozens of them. They're Canadian, they're British, they're Danish, they're this, they're every... They're Spanish, they're, they're every... They're Italian. I watched an Italian one the other day. You know, Netflix, right? It connects us to all these other countries and languages that are writing the same thing about murdering women. So, you know, are we... Is that actually a metaphorical... Is that a metaphor for murdering the earth? Is that why it's so common? You know, so I don't, I don't really have, like, when it comes to um, sadomasochism and extreme sex and kink, I don't really have any moral judgment around that stuff. But I'm, I am very interested in asking the question, why, why is there such an appetite for that? And I think it's true, it is Thanatos. I mean, it's, some, it's another impulse, right? They Eros go is, together. They do go together, yeah. So that was a very long answer. To <laughs> no, it's perfect because actually it's, it's, I'm glad to tackle it like that because it's an endless debate. Yeah, it's a, it's a big conversation. And yeah. my best answer after 30 years is that uh, the only difference is that pornography can turn into a crime. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you mean, it's just the same. Do you mean do you mean that the ma the, 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 the pornographers the can be criminalized or do no. you mean at the act can, can make, be criminal? Uh, you can make a crime through pornography. <coughs> yes, I see what you mean. So the acts Because they are the same. I don't see the difference unless you make a crime through pornography or through eroticism and then mm -hmm. it turns into pornography. And not because I want to see it like that, but because Society has structured the difference like so. Maybe. I'm 
I'm not convinced. What's your next question? <laughs> I'm not convinced that no, it's, it's only good. society. It's good. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Uh, the disagreement is perfect. <laughs> My second question is regarding the, the modern times, and I mean the last 10 years or so, in how, again, society has uh, opened its mind towards the relationship between the same sex. Mm -hmm. Not only love relationships, but also marriage and adoption. Mm -hmm. And we can see now things like, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Doctor Who, for example, right? British TV show. And now the, the, the new companion of the doctor is a, a, is a lesbian university student. Mm -hmm. And you can see through films and TV shows and literature and so on, that now is getting more normalized for the general public. Yeah. It's not anymore taboo. Well, Which for me I don't know, it depends. It depends where you live. In certain, of course. In certain areas it is still very taboo. In many, pla in, I mean, in many places, certainly in Eastern Europe, it's extremely taboo. In many places in the United States, it's very taboo. Well, in Chechnya, well. they are imprisoning uh, homosexuals right, yeah. right now, according yeah. to the news, right? And then, what do you think about that? The, 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 the normalization of, of, of that viewing? Well, I think, that's, I think that's healthy. I think that's right. The and simple answer. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's a pretty simple answer. Now, uh, and the uh, last question is regarding a little bit about the second one, because, uh, as you just said, it depends in what kind of society we live in. Mm -hmm. Because it, it might be normal for everybody to turn on the TV or go to the movies and watch uh, same-sex relationships, and because they, the, the public is safe, according to themselves, because they are watching it through the screen. Mm -hmm. But in real life, I can still see, even in societies such as uh, the island here, mm -hmm. Vancouver Island, which is supposed to be a very open society, mm -hmm. I still can see a lot of prejudice and prejudice, a lot of, and a lot yeah. of uh, hypocrisy about what, yeah. what, what do you think about that one? Well, as I was saying when, when I introduced this new book, I've been very surprised by how it's been a real challenge as a writer. And, and I have a big multinational <coughs> corporation behind me called Random House, Penguin Random House. So supposedly the publicists know what they're doing. But it's been very hard getting publicity for the book and uh, actually introducing the book to the Canadian public. And, and, and no publisher in the United States have, has agreed to publish the book. And I've been published by the most rep reputable literary publisher in the US. And as soon as she read the first 50 pages, she said, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to, uh, I won't be able to publish this book, unfortunately. And you know I'm not a prude. <laughs> she, said, she did. She actually wrote that in her email to me. I was like, yes, yes, Nan. And the hypocrisy of society is right there, because yeah, I, I mean, I, I What's the name of this book? Uh, five Shades of whatever? Fifty. 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 Five, six, 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 six Shades of Brown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, brown. To be quite <laughs> honest, it's such a cheap <laughs> literature. It's so bad. Yes, and, it is and, very and, bad. And it's a bestseller. They are making movies about it. and Everybody knows about it. It's, it's the Bible of erotic literature now, right? <laughs> It's, mm. And it's crazy. Yeah. I don't think no, so. I don't think so. No, I mean, most people acknowledge that that, that it's not Fifty Shades of Grey and the trilogy of Fifty Shades of Grey. Most people acknowledge that it's miserably written. I'm glad and, to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really, really poorly written, and most people agree with that. And they're not reading that book, though, though I think that people are hungry to <coughs> talk honestly about sexuality and, and the boundaries around relationships and how marriage is changing or what sexual experience is, actually. And even what even how sexual wounds, the darker parts of sexuality, influence influence our lives. Um, but it's very, even though I think people are ready to have those conversations, there's not much of a, an outlet for those conversations to take place. So I think that's one of the reasons why when I've read to people in public, 
the response is always very positive and people ask very good questions and are very enthusiastic um, because there is a hunger for that. And that's one of the reasons why Fifty Shades of Grey became a huge bestseller. Mm -hmm. Because they, people are hoping to get a kind of honest way of looking and thinking about sexuality and sexual passion and sexual satisfaction. But those novels are not about that. That's mm -hmm. not really what they're about. The sex is very poorly written. Mm -hmm. And the girl, the girl, because she is a girl, she's in her early 20s, is not interested in the in the kind of sexuality that the main character uh, wants, which is, you know, um, S and M, like a you know an extreme, fairly extreme form of kink. Although when you read it, it's like this doesn't look like any kink mm -hmm. I've ever known about or heard about or read about or whatever or experienced for that matter. Where's my whip? Um, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't. It's not real. But she doesn't like it anyway. She's always very uncomfortable in, the, in, the, in those novels. And the whole point of the story, really, it's like a Harlequin romance. A rich man comes and rescues a poor, naive young woman from her boring life and gives her the fantasy of true love and endless money. And they have a very nice life together. By the end of the three books, he has therapized his S&M tendencies, so he's gone to a, a psychologist and he's discovered that it's his, it was his crack whore mother's fault that he's so screwed up. <laughs> what? I'm so surprised. And, uh, and then by the end, they have vanilla sex, they have a child and they get married. And so their lives are like the normal, happy... Lives of Harlequin romances. Don't tell me more. <laughs> so that's why those books, partly that's why those books were also huge bestsellers, because they mm -hmm. were the same traditional sexual fantasy mm -hmm. of just regular bodice rippers. We call them bodice rippers in English. The bodice being like the top, the fitted top part of a woman's garment. Yes. Bodice rippers. <laughs> Hmm. It's just another bodice ripper with whips and chains. And as I said in, in, during the reading, uh, uh, I would like to say it's a surprise, but it's not a surprise that they are rejecting the police in the United States. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Well, we'll keep working on that. I, I, uh, before saying goodbye and thank you, uh, I, I have to turn the interview into a Fox News channel. <laughs> no. I'm going to show you the, your, your, your book. I mean, I mean, I'm going to show the, the full of your book. Fox News Channel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th this On is... On Protection you, right? Island, Fox <laughs> News brings you <laughs> the change room. Fox News. Oh, Fox News! This is Fox News. Fox News. This is Fox News on Protection Island. In camp, what's the name of this country you invented? During the reading? Can clit. Can clit. Instead of can clit. <laughs> This is Fox News. Fox Can't leave. <laughs> Foxy News. <laughs> On Protection Island. Thank you for the interview, Juan. Thank, thank you very much. Cheers again. Um, thank you all. Thank you for the feeling. Think about it. <laughs>